This here is the, the throne of your heart. All right? That's the throne. Now, every throne needs a king. He's our most distinguished looking one out of the bunch, which doesn't say a lot for them. But he's very kingly. I've known this brother for a long time. Very, very kingly. Today, this king right here, we're going to call him Jesus. Now, I know your wife thinks you're perfect anyway, and so you get to be Jesus today. Now, on the opposite side of Jesus is this one. We're going to call him the flesh, the desires, the temptations. Temptations. Do your name. No? <laughs> and ladies, he is single. And after that, we see why. So, so this here is all temptations built into one. Now this, this, this right here represents you. So, so you've got the king on one side. you got you, male, female. He, he, he identifies as either today. Um, <laughs> That's the society we live in. You can do that. Uh, and then this here is all the battles and frustrations and flesh that you face. Now, in the middle of your life, <laughs> I should have rethought that, shouldn't I? I, I, I really, I've known him long enough. I should have rethought that. You've got a throne. You've got yourself. You've got Jesus. Now, now, for a moment, this here is what it looks like. Can you uh, be gone? Right, right there is good. Uh, this here, come, come sit on your throne. This here is what it looks like to live a life that is directed by your flesh, where you are the one that sits on the throne. And in fact, this here, your temptations, your desires, everything else, Christ is outside of your life. He, he's not a part of your life. And all of a sudden, uh, go ahead and pick your feet up a little bit like you're doing with a little squat. Now, now, you can spin him around uh, however you want to. Why? Because your life is, is controlled, it is controlled, it is directed, you, you think you're calling the shots, but it is directed by, by this, by all the desires, by all the temptations, by all the things that you think, you know what, this will make me happy, and it just does what? Keep on. <laughs> just because I love him, I want to see what happens afterwards. <laughs> And so, so temptations will come, and they, they'll grab a hold of you. But your life will come, and worries will come, and all that stuff just begins to just spin you around, and it spins your life out of control. There's no order there. Uh, this is not kept in check. Why? Because this is the thing that you think, oh, it'll make me happy. This relationship will make me happy. This thing, this money, these finances, all this stuff, it just got control of you, and it's spinning your life out of control. But then one day he says, uh-uh, I got enough. I know that, that I cannot handle being on the throne of my life because this thing right here, all the desires, all the, everything that just gets my world out of whack, all of those things are just spinning my world out of control. And so what does he do? He says, you know, I, I hear that there is a, a Savior who can save me and rescue me from all this stuff, all that stuff that the world tries to tempt me with. So, so what do you do? You, you call upon the Lord. And then the Lord says, you know what? I'm going to come and be a part of of your life. Now when this works, what happens is, is that you say, you know what, I can't do my life on my own, I can't handle my life on my own, and so I get off of the throne of my life, and then I say, you know what, Lord, I, I know I can't handle my life, Lord, I ask you to be the king and the ruler of my life. Now unlike you, you, you ain't spinning this one, because he, he is in control. And the only position that he has when he is in control, when he is the ruler and guider, is that now you are submitted to him. And guess what? Come on this side. Uh, you, 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 you go wherever he, he tells you to go. All right. Now, <laughs> all right, let's start there. But see, what happens is, is that he says now, you know what? In check, when the king is in his rightful place, in check, he now determines, you know, that, that desire is not for you. That's not going to make you happy. This is not what you want. I know that's what your flesh says, but when you live according to the Spirit, the Spirit leads you and guides you and directs you in the way that you should go. You know what the problem is, though? Is that oftentimes we've asked Jesus to come down in our life, but then we've said, you know what, Jesus? I'm glad you're here. You sit close by, but I want to be the one that calls the shots. I, I want to be the one that still is on the throne. It's, it's, it's my life. 
So you know, so so if I'm the one who does what? I, well, who was that? I don't even know. Uh, yeah, that's a trick question. I knew who it was, but all y'all sinners just knew. All right, so you know, I know y'all play this now. Uh, but what happens is when this one says no, Jesus, I'm glad you're here. You're my friend. You're my savior. But I want to do whatever I want to do. And guess what happens? When he's in your life, you start calling on this thing to make you happy. Your world will never be at peace. Why? Because it's not meant to have you on the throne. And it's definitely not meant to have him on the throne. The only one that's meant to be on the throne of your life is not you. It is him. And when he is on the throne of your life, then he directs. And he leads. And there's peace in that. There's life in that. There's direction in that. And there's hope in that. There's nothing but battle that goes on if you, you, decide to fight him in order to get those things that you think will make you happy. There will never be peace there. It will always be an enmity is what the Bible says. You will always be at war in your spirit. There will always be a battle place in the middle of that thing if you don't let him, Jesus, sit on his rightful place in your life. Thank you. Sing it out every blessing. Every blessing. Welcome to Westside Emmanuel Baptist Church, the church that loves God and loves people. We're in the heart of Bogalusa with Bogalusa on our heart. We look forward to you joining us in person sometime soon as we worship the Lord together.
And the reason why it is a Game of Thrones is because there are these seven kingdoms. There's all these people trying to get to the Iron Throne and be the king over everything. Who is the rightful heir? Dragons and magic and everything else. But who will rule and who will reign? They did a study on the number of deaths per episode. The number of people who were killed per episode. And they showed, and this, this show, Game of Thrones, ranked second among all shows. They had like 14 deaths per episode uh, because these folks were trying to get to the Iron Throne. They were trying to go and trying to rule and reign over everything. Who will sit on the Iron Throne? Now that is good for a game show or it is good for a movie or good for a TV of who will actually be able to ascend to the throne, who will kill and murder and conspire to get to the throne, who will be able to be seated on the throne. You may not know this or not, but this morning there is a Game of Thrones happening for your heart. And really the question is this morning, who is going to sit on the throne of your heart? Who will rule and reign over your life? Who will make the decisions that, that rule and guide your life? In Romans chapter 8, we've been looking at a series of messages called Inseparable. That there is nothing that can separate you and I from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. But in Romans chapter 8, if you turn in your Bible to, to verse 4 and following, there is a description about a battle that is taking place even right now. A battle of your own heart and in your mind and your spirit. There's a battle going on to determine who is going to sit on that throne. So if you have your Bible this morning, I invite you to turn to Romans chapter 8. There's been a battle since 2011 on the Game of Thrones, and every day of your life you're going to face a battle. And while Game of Thrones came in second, there's not a second of your life that the devil does not want to rule and reign over your heart and over your life and have dominion there. But in Romans chapter 8, we find not only the battle, but the victory. So when you find that new word, would you stand with me as we read God's word together? Romans chapter 8. A Game of Thrones for your heart to rule and reign over your life. Who is sitting on that throne today. Appreciate the instrumentalists and the singers this morning. Appreciate Brother Wayland's leadership as he just guides us this morning to the throne of grace. Romans chapter 8, starting verse 1. There is therefore, and we looked at this last week, there is therefore now what? Yeah. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Man, that message was uh, just blessed my own heart to just read that. Who, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did. God did it by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, 
Do not walk according to the Spirit, or according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And this is what we're going to focus on, verse 5 and following. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is an enmity or a war against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Father, I thank you for your word. Even through reading this lengthy portion of scripture, Father, I thank you that there is life and peace and blessing through Jesus Christ. And that to live in the flesh and according to the ways of the world and our own desires, that there is nothing but death and heartache and frustration. May we live walk and breathe in the spirit today. Rule and reign over our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. As you're seated this morning, there, there is, as we get into October, because it really feels like October outside. Isn't this the greatest fair weather, right? I mean, I, I talked to a buddy of mine the other day. We're going to wear shorts and our Ugg boots at the same time to the fair. Uh, you know, don't, don't hate because I have some Ugg boots. I happen to have fur on the inside. It's just the way we roll in Hawaii, all right? And so we're going to go to the fair. <laughs> Jay looked at me. I'm sorry, Jay. It's just part of being in Hawaii. Um, Jay always tells me, like, you know what? That's one more reason why I'm not sure if you and I can be friends. But, but I love this, brother, so I, I can understand it. But you notice outside, the fair is beginning to come, the weather is changing, uh, never mind, the leaves are changing, uh, never mind, it's beginning to get cool, oh, okay, never mind, uh, but it is beginning to get closer to that time where you get to watch uh, all your Lifetime movies and everything on the Hallmark Channel, is that true? Alright, so some of you are kind of nesting, you're getting into that little warm zone, I don't know if any of you had a fire at your house yet, um, you know, or if you're trying to get warm and have your little cozy blanket and stuff. But one of my favorite times of this year is when Christmas movies start coming around. Walmart's already got all their Christmas stuff up, and so you know what? You've probably been getting into the Christmas spirit yourself. There's just a couple more weeks until Christmas time. But one of my favorite movies during Christmas time is this thing about this huge guy who wears a little green outfit, and he's got a green hat on, and it's called Elf. You ever seen that? Some of y'all probably like this movie. Well, there's a certain scene in there where he, because he's been with Santa all of his life, he all of a sudden goes up, and there's an imposter on the throne, a fake Santa. And so he, Elf, all of a sudden comes up next to that guy, and he begins to smell, and he says, you know what? You smell like meat and cheese. And he has to look at this guy, and he says this line. It's a very famous line in this movie. He says, you sit on a throne of lies. Sitting on a throne of lies. You, you know what? For some of us, when we have this battle between the flesh and the spirit, and there is a battle, and you probably know this in your own life, but there is a battle between what God wants you to do and what the flesh and the devil wants you to do. There's a battle between the right and the wrong things in your life. And so sometimes we allow other things to rule and reign over us on a throne of lies. Did you notice in Romans chapter 8 verse 5 and following about what it says about the flesh? You see, if we want to see what this battle is like, I want to kind of give you an idea of what this battle of who the two people are that are warring inside of your own body this morning. Verse 5 says that those who live according to the flesh, they do one thing, they set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. You, you know, when you live according to the flesh, there's a battle going on, and it is a battle that begins right up in here. This is where Satan tries to attack. This is where the battle happens in your life. Everything. I think Brother Wayne, there's an old country song that talks about stinking thinking. Is that a country song? Or maybe it should be. Let's write that, you know. Uh, you know. But, 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 but up here in your mind, it, you know, the mind is a dangerous place to waste. And, and some of our minds have been wasted away for a long time. Physically uh, and spiritually and emotionally as well. Because some of us have wasted what God's given us something. And we know what it's like to have this constant battle of worry and doubt and frustration and stress and, and things that are coming at your mind. And so those who live according to the flesh, Paul says, look, those folks set their mind. Their whole focus is on the things of the flesh. And so here the Bible says that's what your mind is set on. But not only that, but to be set on your, your mind on the flesh is actually, verse 6 says, to be carnally minded is, is dead. 
death. It, not only is it death, but verse 7 says it is at enmity or at war against God. Verse 7 also says, look, they're not even subject to the law, nor indeed can it be. There's a battle that's happening inside between your flesh and your spirit. And that, that battle of that flesh, the flesh always is focused and thinking about, well, what can I do to make this flesh happy? How can I fulfill my desires? It is, you know... Uh, we have seen, and you probably have folks in your own life, and you may have even uh, struggled with addictions to where you've seen folks who become so consumed. They're, they're always thinking, what is my next hit? What is my next thing that I can get? What's that next thing that will make me happy? How can I grab a hold of that thing? Well, that is not only true for an addict when it comes to drugs or anything else. That is true even in your own life. It could be any kind of thing that, that constantly gnaws at you and tries to tear your attention away from the Lord, that constantly tries to get your mind set on those things. And it's always at war with the things of, of God himself. And so the Bible says in verse 8, that those who live in the flesh, they cannot please God. And so when you live this battle and you give in to your flesh and your fleshly desires, those things that God says, look, don't live that way, don't act that way, don't, don't begin to just, uh, uh, just engage in those things, that the Bible says, look, you can't even... Please, God, in the middle of that. What does that look like? So the Bible says, look, don't live according to the flesh, but what does that look like? Well, I want to read to you this message. It's called the Message Bible. Some of you, when you're studying your Bible, sometimes there's a, a translation of the Bible called the Message Bible. It's not great for, you know, just to get serious study, but it's a devotional Bible, which helps you kind of listen and think about things in a certain different way. So Galatians chapter 5, this is what it says in the Message Bible. It is obvious what kind of life, this is verse 19 in Galatians chapter 5, it is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Here's the works of the flesh. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. That applies to our culture today. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. That applies to many of our lives today. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied once, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. We've seen this in this whole confirmation here. It's uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community. And Paul says, I could go on. Now, as you look at those descriptions up on the screen, or you can see it in your Bible, in the Message Bible, that very much describes what it's like to live a life of in the flesh. To always want to never be satisfied, to always be at war with others and to never quite get your way, to always have this struggle that is inside, to want your flesh, to, to never be satisfied, to always want more, to always want to get this, and always to step ahead of somebody. This is the, the works of the flesh, to always be divided, and to, to just always be the, depersonalizing in every rival. I mean, that's the works of the flesh. The Bible says, look, the works of the flesh, when you get in that, that battle, if you give into the flesh, there's nothing but death, frustration, to be at war with God, and you won't inherit God's kingdom. Now, you may have read, as we read through that passage a little while ago, you may have thought, well, you know what? Some of that is, is me. I'm never quite satisfied. I always have uncontrollable anger. There's always times in my own life and in my house, and we come to church, but my house is divided, and we can't, we can't even get along. I can't even get along in my own mind, and there's all this stuff that is going on in my own life. This is, this is not a description of some other person. This is a description of, of me. And the Bible says, according to Galatians chapter 5, it says, look, those who are in the Spirit, those who live according to the Spirit, those who are God's people, those are descriptions that should not be true of your life and my life. You can't just call yourself a Christian and just live however you want to live and say, well, God's going to forgive me in the end. It's going to be all right. And he's going to bless me in the end. No, no, you can't just do that. Why? Because, because when God changes you, he changes you from the inside out. But there ought to be a change. You ought to look at your life and say, you know what, they're not living according to the flesh. I know what they used to be like, but they're living according to the spirit. They, they live according to the, the things of God. And, and today, some of you, honestly, I just I speak to you as your pastor, as your friend, kind of friends. But I speak to you as your friend, and I, I, I beg, I, I'll plead with you. For some of you, the reason why you're never quite overcoming, why you are always in a battle, why it always seems like things are not going right in your life, could it be? And it's truly because... You've never, ever given your life to Jesus Christ. 
You continue to walk in the flesh, continue to walk in the old ways, continue to walk in the ways that you don't want to live. Why? Because, because you've never truly said, you know what? I need to give my life to Jesus. Yes, I've been to church. Yes, I've been baptized when I was a kid. Yes, I did this and I did that. But I've never truly trusted Jesus with my whole life, with everything that's inside me. And so the Bible says, look, those who live in the flesh, they can't please God, will not follow God. They're at war with God. We need to give our life to Jesus. But, verse 9 says in Romans chapter 8, but you are not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit. So what does that mean to be in Christ? So, so if we know the flesh is all about what I want, what I can get, what I can have, well, what does it mean then that we are in Christ? That, that you know, if you have the spirit of Christ, you, you truly belong to him. Verse 10 says the spirit is, is life that gives you life because of righteousness. What does it look like then to live according to the spirit? If the flesh is all about what I want and I can't ever get enough, what does it mean to live according to the spirit? When the spirit of God rules and reigns over our life. Well, Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 says it real easily. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. So I wonder if you look at that description of what it means, this is what ought to be true for you and I as a believer in Christ. Is that what is true of your life? Is there, is there any love in your life? Now I know that Tina has what's love got to do with it, but love has everything to do with it. Because love is truly the expression, the fulfillment of the law of God. And so if you say to yourself, well, I love God, but I can't love anybody around me. I can't love my brother, my sister. I can't love them. I can't love folks like that. I can't love these kind of folks. Then, friends, you don't understand what the love of God is. The Bible says, look, those who are in Christ, the fruit of the Spirit of Christ is love and joy. Would you look? I'm not even going to look up for a minute. Would you look at the person next to you? Does their face have any J-O-Y on it? Didn't there used to be some washing detergent called joy? Don't you wish sometimes you could spread that on somebody's face and just let them know, you know, could you just have a little bit, like, like just, just on the side of one face, you know, just kind of, uh, just, you know, just put a little bit of joy, love, joy, peace. I know as soon as you men go home to your, your house, there's nothing but peace. All your kids are acting right, your spouse or, or the person that you love in that house. Boy, they're always happy to see you. <laughs> Peace. All right, long-suffering. You may get that later on. You may suffer a real long time. Uh, uh, but, but kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, I mean, are those evident in your life? You see, if you're a true believer in Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God directs you. He moves you. And those are the things that ought to be true for you. And it's in a relationship to Jesus. But... But in this battle, so let's just talk about this battle that you and I face. If it is battle between the flesh and the spirit, if it is that you know, if I live according to the flesh and continue in the ways of the flesh, that I'm always going to just do whatever I want, or if I live according to the spirit, I'm going to experience life and joy and peace in my life. If that is true, does that mean that as a believer in Jesus, that I'll never have another struggle once I get my life here? Does it mean as a believer in Jesus that everything's always going to be hunky-dory, everything's going to always be fun, I'm always going to be happy, I'm always going to be joyful, I'm always going to be singing peaceful songs, I'm always going to be so glad that I'm here, oh bless you, hallelujah, thank the Lord, Lord's good, hallelujah, amen. Is that true of your Christian life? No. Because see, Paul even says, look, he, he described this battle, and if you put it back one chapter, in Romans chapter 7, verse 15, the Bible says, this is Paul. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. I mean, this little guy who loved the Lord Jesus, he, he was dramatically changed on the road to Damascus. He saw a bright light. The Lord came and changed his life. I mean, this dude who used to kill Christians had an amazing experience in his life. But he says this is the battle that he still faces. Verse 15. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Now that may confuse you. Look at verse 19. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that's the stuff I practice. Can you relate to that? Boy, I want to do good. Boy, I want to love the Lord. Boy, I want to be patient. That's what I want to do. But that person got on my last nerve and drove every one of my pieces of patience away. Boy, I just want to just take my chair and do like that dude did after that UFC fight last night, climb underneath that rail and just jump up and start swinging at everybody left and right. You ever done that? Boy, boy, I really want to serve the Lord and get closer to him, but 
But don't worry, there's a lot of temptations in there. I'm not really sure what I want to do. The very things that I, I will to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, those are the very things that I practice. This is Paul, and he's speaking about this battle that he has between, you know what, I know what I ought to do, but I do the opposite. And I don't want to do this opposite, but that's the very things I end up doing. And he talks about this, this battle, and in fact, in verse 24, he says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? And so he talks about this battle. And if it was real for Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, I guarantee you it's going to be real for every one of us in here. That you want to grow closer to the Lord. You want to read your Bible. You want to tell other people about Jesus Christ. But instead of doing that, you fall into one sin and one temptation and one worry and one struggle. And the things that I wish I could do and just follow Jesus day after day, I end up doing the totally opposite thing. What in the world is wrong with me? It's the Spirit and the flesh. And they are a battle going on inside of you. Now, how in the world do you have any victory over this battle? Well, it's found in Romans 8 and 11, where the Bible says, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Oh, preacher, you don't understand how hard my struggle is. Preacher, you don't understand how many people come and how difficult they make my life. Preacher, you don't understand how many times that I just wish I could grab a hold of somebody. Preacher, you don't understand the burdens that I bear and that I carry. Preacher, you don't know just how horrible life is. How dark the times are in my marriage and my friendships and my relationships with me and my kids with everything else. Preacher, you don't know how dead I feel inside. You don't know how, how dead it seems in my life. You don't know how dead it seems in my family. There's no hope and, and no beginning and nothing. You don't understand the, the depths of the sorrow that I face. And yet he says in verse 11 that the very spirit of him who raised Jesus up from the dead is the same Spirit of God that lives inside of you. And if He lives inside of you who raised Him from the dead, then there is nothing but life and hope and peace for you in Jesus Christ. Amen? I mean, there's, there's, there's life in Jesus. Why? Because as dead as dead could be, you ain't never been as dead as Jesus. You ain't never had the sins of the world upon your shoulders. You ain't never carried every burden and sin and sorrow. You have had a bad time in life. But you ain't died for a single person. And yet Jesus, the Bible says that he was raised from the dead. And now he dwelleth in you. That's my best King James Version that I know. He dwells, he lives, he resides inside of you. That's why it says in Romans 7, 24. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This here is the, the throne of your heart. All right? That's the throne. And every throne needs a king. He's our most distinguished looking one out of the bunch, which doesn't say a lot for them. But he's very kingly. I've known this brother for a long time. Very, very king. Today, this king right here, we're going to call him Jesus. Now, I know your wife thinks you're perfect anyway, and so you get to be Jesus today. Now, on the opposite side of Jesus is this. We're going to call him the flesh, the desires, the temptations. Temptations. Do your names. No? <laughs> and ladies, he is single. And after that, we see why. So, so this here is all temptations built into one. Now this, this, this right here represents you. So, so you've got the king on one side. You've got you, male, female. He, he, he identifies as either today. Um, <laughs> That's the society we live in. You can do that. Uh, and then this here is all the battles and frustrations and flesh that you face. Now, in the middle of your life, <laughs> I should have rethought that, shouldn't I? I, I, I really, I've known him long enough. I should have rethought that. 
You've got a throne. You got yourself. You got Jesus. Now, now for a moment, this here is what it looks like. Can you uh, be gone? Right, right there is good. Uh, this here, come, come sit on your throne. This here is what it looks like to live a life that is directed by your flesh, where you are the one that sits on the throne. And in fact, this here, your temptations, your desires, everything else, Christ is outside of your life. He, he's not a part of your life. And all of a sudden, uh, go ahead and pick your feet up a little bit like you do in a little squat. Now, now you can spin him around uh, however you want to. Why? Because your life is, is controlled. It is controlled. It is directed. You, you think you're calling the shots, but it is directed by, by this, by all the desires, by all the temptations, by all the things that you think, you know what, this will make me happy. And it just does what? Uh, keep on. <laughs> just because I love you, I want to see what happens afterwards. Uh, and and so, so temptations will come. And, and they, they'll grab a hold of you. But your life will come. And worries will come. And all that stuff just begins to just spin you around. And it spins your life out of control. There's no order there. Uh, this is not kept in check. Why? Because this is the thing that you think, oh, it'll make me happy. This relationship will make me happy. This thing, this money, these finances, all this stuff has just got control of you and it's spinning your life out of control. But then one day he says, uh-uh, I got enough. I know that, that I cannot handle being on the throne of my life because this thing right here, all the desires, all the, everything that just gets my world out of whack, all of those things are just spinning my world out of control. And so what does he do? He says, you know, I, I hear that there is a, a savior who can save me and rescue me from all this stuff. All that stuff that the world tries to tempt me with. So, so what do you do? You, you call upon the Lord. And then the Lord says, you know what? I'm going to come and be a part of, of your life. Now when this works, what happens is, is that you say, you know what? I can't do my life on my own. I can't handle my life on my own. And so I get off of the throne of my life. And then I say, you know what, Lord? I, I know I can't handle my life. Lord, I ask you to be the king and the ruler of my life. Now, unlike you, you, you ain't spinning this one. Because he, he is in control. And the only position that he has when he is in control, when he is the ruler and godder, is that now you are submitted to him. And guess what? Come on this side for me, bro. Uh, you, you, you go wherever he, he tells you to go. All right. Now, <laughs> all right, let's start there. But see, what happens is, is that he says now, you know what? In check... When the king is in his rightful place, in check, he now determines, no, that, that desire is not for you. That's not going to make you happy. This is not what you want. I know that's what your flesh says, but when you live according to the Spirit, the Spirit leads you and guides you and directs you in the way that you should go. You know what the problem is, though? Is that oftentimes we've asked Jesus to come down our life, but then we've said, you know what, Jesus? I'm glad you're here. You sit close by, but I want to be the one that calls the shots. I want to be the one that still is on the throne. It's, it's, it's my life. It's now going down the throne. So, you know, so, so it's, I'm the one who does what, what, who was that? I don't even know. Uh, yeah, that was a trick question. I knew who it was. All y'all sinners just do. All right, so, you know, I know y'all play this now. Uh, but what happens is when this one says, no, Jesus, I'm glad you're here. You're my friend. You're my savior. But I want to do whatever I want to do. And guess what happens? When he's in your life, you start calling on this thing to make you happy, your world will never be at peace. Why? Because it's not meant to have you on the throne, and it's definitely not meant to have him on the throne. The only one that's meant to be on the throne of your life is not you, it is him. And when he is on the throne of your life, then he directs, and he leads. And there's peace in that. There's life in that. There's direction in that, and there's hope in that. There's nothing but battle that goes on if you, you, decide to fight him in order to get those things that you think will make you happy. There'll never be peace there. It'll always be an enmity is what the Bible says. You'll always be at war in your spirit. There'll always be a battle place in the middle of that thing if you don't let him, Jesus, sit on his rightful place in your life. Thank you, guys. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says these words. It says, you know what? In your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Well, what does that mean? 
It means that you recognize I, there is a throne. There is someone who is leading and guiding my life. There is someone who is there who ought to be the ruler and reigner over my life. And I don't need to sit on this throne because some of you know what it's like to sit on the throne of your life because you still face every scar and every bad decision and every regret. Why? Because you decided I'm going to sit up here in Big Daddy's chair. That ain't your chair at my house. It ain't your chair in your heart. It ain't your chair on the throne. There's only one who's the ruler and the reigner and the king. And his name is Jesus. Amen. And you know what some of us need to do today? Some of us need to go and say, you know what, Lord? Let the king of my heart be the heir and the motion and the, the mover, be, be the guider of my life. Let the king of my heart be everything. Lord, I invite you today to be the king of my life. If he can rule over every star in the universe, can he rule over your life? If he can rise from the dead and now the Spirit of God dwells inside of you, can't he do with your life more than you ever could? Can't he lead you? Can't he guide you? Can't he direct you? Can't you say that today will be the day that I get off of the throne, I let Jesus rule and reign? And you know what there happens to be? When I used to live in Germany, we would spend time and we'd go to castles that always had these big old thrones. And you know, there's people that get reared at the castle and stuff in Frankfurt. You got these big old thrones over there. Well, you know what would happen whenever you walk into a throne room of a king? You didn't just come in there and be like, what? You know, what? what? No, that is not your posture. You, you didn't come in there and say, you know what? Hey, bro, get off of the throne. No, that, that wasn't your posture either. When you came to the throne room of a king, you had one posture and one way to submit to him, and it was basically you'd come and you'd get on your knees and you would bow before the king. You know what the Bible says? One day, every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Would that one day be this day? As you say, I'm tired of playing games with thrones. But I give the King of Kings the throne of my heart. Would you bow for a moment? So heads are bowed, as our eyes are closed. I want you to, to imagine for a second. As it says in Isaiah chapter 6, there were a ton of people in church on that day of Isaiah chapter 6. A lot of people worshiping, they brought sacrifices, a lot of people around them. But the Bible says that on that day, out of all the people that were in church that day, out of that day, the Bible says Isaiah saw the Lord. And when he saw the Lord, he saw his own sin. And he turned away from that, but he turned his life over to Jesus. He bowed down at the altar of the Lord. Friends, today, are you frustrated? Are you living in fear and sadness and sorrow? Does it seem like something just is not right in your life? Could it be the reason why your marriage is messed up, why your friendships are messed up, why your own life is messed up? Could it be because Jesus is not in his rightful place. He's not on the throne of your heart. And you've tried it your own way. You've done it your own way. You failed it your own way. And maybe today, you say, Jesus, be my king. You are my king. Father, I thank you for this morning. I just pray, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, thank you for joining us today at Westside Emmanuel Baptist Church, the church that loves God and loves people. We hope you'll be able to join us this coming Sunday at 10.30 a.m. or 6 o'clock in the evening time. Wednesdays at 6 o'clock for our prayer service. And we also have youth and children's activities as well. We look forward to seeing you. Hope to meet you in person here in Bogalusa with Bogalusa on our heart. We hope to see you soon.